Welcome to this new chapter entitled Measurements in Radiography. At the conclusion of this module, the participant should be able to master the measurements made on different radiographic images. This module will cover the following areas, spine, pelvic parameters, goniometry, dynamic x-rays of the knee, dynamic x-rays of the ankle, and foot static x-rays, including weight bearing. We will first explore what measurements are made on spinal radiographs. The Cobb angle is the most common measurement technique used to quantify the degree of spinal deformity, particularly in the case of scoliosis. Scoliosis can be defined as a lateral spinal curvature with a Cobb angle greater than 10 degrees. To measure the Cobb angle, we have first to select the terminal vertebrae of the curved deformity on its upper and lower edges. In other words, the terminal vertebrae are the vertebra whose end plates are the most tilted towards each other. Then, we draw lines along the end plates and we measure the angle between the two lines where they intersect. A Cobb angle in the range of 10 to 20 degrees is considered as a mild scoliosis. When a Cobb angle ranges from 20 to 40 degrees, the scoliosis severity is moderate. And a Cobb angle that is greater than 40 degrees means severe scoliosis. The Chamberlain line is drawn from the posterior of the hard palate to the median point of the posterior margin of the foramen magnum. It helps to recognize basilar invagination which is a cranial cervical junction abnormality where the tip of the dens projects up into the foramen magnum. This is present if the tip of the dens extends greater than three millimeters above this line. When the posterior aspect of the foramen magnum or the opisthian cannot be identified, it is recommended to use the McGregor line. The McGregor line connects the posterior edge of the hard palate to the most caudal point of the occipital curve. If the tip of the dens lies more than 4.5 millimeters above this line, this indicates the presence of basilar invagination. Here, we can see how the lumbar lordotic angle is measured. Using Cobb's method, tangent lines are drawn along the upper plane of the L1 lumbar vertebra and the upper plane of the S1 sacral vertebra. Then, perpendiculars to each of these two lines are added to form the angle. We talk about excessive lordosis or EL when the angle is over 75 degrees, normal lordosis or NL when the angle is 40 degrees, hypolordosis or HL when the angle is 20 degrees, and lumbar kyphosis when the angle is 5 degrees. 
Now let's move to measurements in pelvic imaging. Pelvic tilt is an asymmetry in the pelvis where the pelvis is lower on one side than the other. This tilt is possible because of the structure and anatomy of the pelvis. Pelvic tilt is measured on an AP pelvic radiograph as the distance between the upper edge of the symphysis pubis and the mid portion of the sacrococcygeal joint. As a rule of thumb, the distance should be around 32 millimeters in men and 47 millimeters in women. The coxometry measurement is helpful for the assessment of hip dysplasia. On an AP pelvic radiograph, we are going to measure the lateral center edge angle, which is a radiographic measurement of the lateral covering of the femoral head by the acetabular roof. On the AP pelvic radiograph, the lateral center edge angle or VCE angle is an angle that is formed by a vertical line drawn through the center of the femoral head running along the longitudinal axis of the pelvis and a line drawn from the center of the femoral head to the lateral acetabular rim. Values between 25 degrees and 39 degrees are considered within the normal range. An angle of less than 20 degrees is considered an indication of acetabular dysplasia, while an angle of more than 40 degrees is considered to indicate coxa profunda. If the value is between 20 degrees and 25 degrees, the patient is presenting with borderline acetabular dysplasia. The cervico-diaphyseal angle, or neck shaft angle, or capital NSA, also known as caput carum diaphyseal, or CCD angle. This is the angle made by the neck of the femur with the femoral shaft. It is formed by the longitudinal femoral shaft axis and the femoral head neck axis. The normal value is between 120 and 137 degrees. Below 120 degrees, or above 140 degrees, we can say that the patient is suffering from dysplasia. Lateral coverage of the femoral head is measured by drawing a vertical line passing through the head of the femur and then a second line passing through the lateral edge of the acetabular roof crossing the center of the femoral head. This angle must be greater than 25 degrees to be considered normal. A patient with dysplasia will have a measurement of less than 20 degrees or greater than 40 degrees. The anterior center edge angle also known as the vertical center anterior or VCA is a measurement of the anterior coverage of the femoral head by the acetabulum. This angle is measured in a false profile view of the hip joint. The angle is measured between a vertical line through the center of the femoral head 
and a line from the center of the hip to the anterior most aspect of the acetabulum. Values between 20 and 45 degrees are considered to be within the normal range. Therefore, measurements less than 20 degrees or greater than 40 degrees again indicate dysplasia. Now let's move on to goniometry and dynamic x-rays of the knee. Goniometry is a procedure for diagnosing abnormalities of the knees and legs. Goniometry aims to assess the progress of a pathology or the effectiveness of an orthopedic correction. Goniometry is used in preparation for orthopedic surgery on the knee. The femoral tibial angle is formed by the intersection of a line bisecting the tibia and a line bisecting the femur. When the angle exceeds two degrees in men and three degrees in women, valgus varus is indicated. A dynamic x-ray of the knee allows assessment of the extent of laxity in the knee ligaments. As a reminder, at the knee level we find the lateral ligaments which are internal and external and the cruciate ligaments which are anterior and posterior. On the front view of the knee, varus indicates external lateral ligament abnormality, while valgus indicates internal lateral ligament abnormalities. It is important to make a comparison of the two knees. On a profile view of the knee, the anterior draw test is used to assess the stability of the anterior cruciate ligament, or ACL, while the posterior drawer test assesses the posterior cruciate ligament tears. And last but not least, let's cover dynamic x-rays of the ankle and weight-bearing dorsal plantar foot. An AP stress view of the ankle is used to assess the integrity of the deltoid ligament and the syndesmosis. This can be performed with gravity or via manual external rotation. For a mechanical stress view, the patient can be sitting upright with the leg straightened on the table. The leg is then rotated internally 15 to 20 degrees. The radiologist will then place the ankle into supination and external rotation. The anterior draw test assesses stability of the anterior talofibular ligament with the patient seated and the knee flexed approximately 90 degrees, the technologist should place the ankle within approximately 20 degrees of plantar flexion. Then the technologist provides slight posterior force to the anterior aspect of the distal tibia with one hand, cups the palm of the other hand around the posterior aspect of the calcaneus, and attempts to bring the calcaneus and talus forward on the tibia. When performing the anterior drawer test, always remember to compare the affected ankle 
with the normal side. Measurements of the foot curvature correspond to radiologic analysis of an imbalance in one of the feet. It is necessary to acquire dorso plantar and lateral weight bearing views of the foot for this. This view is key to assessment of foot alignment and the diagnosis of abnormalities that are causing foot pain. In some cases, bilateral projections may be requested for comparison purposes. On a weight-bearing dorsoplantar foot radiograph, we can measure the opening angle of the forefoot. For this, we must draw the axis of the first metatarsal and the axis of the fifth metatarsal and then measure the angle between them. A normal angle is an angle of 15 to 20 degrees. The foot will be considered concave when the angle is less than 20 degrees. If the angle is greater than 25 degrees, there is sagging of the anterior arch of the foot. On a weight-bearing lateral foot radiograph, we can measure the angle of the medial arch, or Gian Anwar angle. The angle is formed between the calcaneal inclination axis and a line drawn along the inferior edge of the fifth metatarsal. A normal angle is between 150 and 170 degrees. When the angle is greater than 170 degrees, the foot is considered flat. Whereas, when it is less than 150 degrees, the foot is considered caved in with a high longitudinal arch. Medical professionals, thanks you for your attention. Thanks for watching. To purchase the full course and earn your CE credits, click on the link in the description or head on over to our website at www.medical-professionals.com. And while you're there, check out our all-access pass, where you can get unlimited CE credits for your state and ARRT renewal for just $49.99. We also offer a host of free resources to make it easier than ever for radiologic technologists like you to achieve excellence. Check out our free radiology CE webinars, clinical reference guides, and free CE courses on our website today. Be more than just certified. Choose medical professionals.